Hi, everyone, and, and welcome to this, uh, this interview and series that we're calling Critical Thinking, Analysis and Materials to Combat Climate Change. Uh, I can think of no one better than uh, John Hikeway, who is a co-founder of Storm Crow Capital, uh, to, to, to talk to you about this. Because amongst other things, he's been at almost every single show, either hosted or spoken at them since 2009, uh, every critical material conference, either in the West or even in China. Uh, he's done work on alternative energy, battery, and mechanical energy storage and neutrinos. John holds a PhD in physics from the University of Manitoba and an MBA from Queens, co-recipient of the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. Uh, wow, it's a real treat to have someone here who can walk us through what really is the goal, like to keep our eyes on the prize and look at these critical metals, critical materials that we're hearing so much about in the news and how we can get towards. The, the goals that we're looking for. John, it's a real pleasure having you on. Uh, it's a real treat to have your expertise. Let's just get into it and get at it and, and look sure. at this quickly. Listen, let's just keep it simple. What's the problem here? <laughs> let's identify <laughs> what the problem here is and, and let people know. Like, because uh, there's lots of information out there. If we could go, here's the problem and here's what we're trying to solve. Well, I guess the, the major problem, Andrew, and, and I think almost everyone in the, in the climate change community recognizes what it is. It's the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. End of story. End of story. Um, I think you go back 300,000 years, that was the last peak for carbon dioxide in the air, and it was about 300 parts per million at that point. If you'll recall, I'm sure no one has actually been back there, but if you recall your history at that point, we were in the middle of a, a global a global hot spell uh, to end all hot spells. It lasted for a long period of time. And then we've oscillated between ice ages and other things. These days, we've managed to push carbon dioxide in the air up over 400 parts per million. None of the modeling is exactly sure when temperatures would peak from this sort of thing, but we all know it's probably going to get worse. Now, that doesn't mean that every spot on Earth is going to get warmer every day. There's going to be places that experience extreme changes in weather as a result of this sort of thing. But it's also increasing faster than it's ever increased before. And I know there are skeptics out there. I know there are people that say either A, carbon dioxide isn't really a greenhouse gas. B, little bitty human beings like us can't actually change the atmosphere and the world that much. But I have to say, unfortunately, both those lines of thinking are wrong. And we are in the middle of a very serious problem. My other problem with all of this, though, is our governments don't seem to be doing much about it. And I think part of that is the reason that most of the citizens doing the voting out there don't really understand the problem at its core and what can be done about it either. Excellent. So if they have to like, just get some, like to pull some on side a bit more, what would sure. be the harm uh, in applying a carbon strategy? So to get less pollutants out in the air. So if we say, listen, let's take the carbon out and, and just focus on that being a problem. Say, if there was a way to do things cleaner and shift in energy, uh, where, what's the harm in doing that? Uh, why would why shouldn't we try? Uh, wouldn't it be a noble exercise to say, listen, here's a model. We think it, it is this. Uh, shouldn't we be trying to get more pollutants out anyway? If I'm trying to grab someone out who says, I don't, I think it's a political thing. I think it's this. I think it's that. Okay, let's take that aside and go. Yeah, yeah. Like, how can we pull some people over? Well, I, I think I think that's actually not only a worthy position and a worthy goal, Andrew, but it's actually the position that the Chinese government is in. I mean, they're not looking at shutting down coal plants and switching their energy sources because necessarily or only of global climate change. They're looking at it from the point of view of cleaning the air for Chinese citizens. So if you're shutting down a coal plant and you're taking that amount of particulate, that amount of sulfate and everything else out of the air. And yes, coincidentally, you're dropping out a lot of carbon dioxide as well. But I mean, that aside, you're cleaning up the air for the average person every day. You're giving them more of those blue sky days that yes. the Chinese government talks about. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, do you think in part, uh, like you're talking about 
there's some political uh, maneuvering. Do you think in part that's maybe causing some of the skepticism as well? Is that um, you've made some good points when we talked in private uh, about the approach that's being taken and maybe because it's not cohesive uh, that maybe that's actually causing more uh, concern. Like if there was a specific uh, factual step-by-step -step milestone, we'd probably have a better framework to work upon rather than uh, some mixed messaging. Well, I, look, I, I can't agree more, Andrew. And I think part of the problem that we're getting with some of the messaging from the government and from and from the media, you know, and, and people within it is that this is either an insurmountable problem, something that we can't deal with because either it'll cause economic upheaval or there'll be other there'll be other things happening. Or it's it's such an easy problem to solve that we've already solved it. Yes. You know, the, 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 that solution on that side is buy yourself a Tesla, drive a Tesla, everything's fine. Or, yes. you know, yeah, we'll need a Tesla, but we'll, you know, if we just add a little bit of wind and solar to the grid, we're great. You know, and, and that isn't true either. So, you know, my position and, and I think something that we'll be discussing over a number of these, uh, a number of these little interviews is the idea that, yes, we can make an, a difference. Yes, we can make a difference of the magnitude required when you read reports from some of the international climate change conferences that are going on, COP26, COP27 and the like. And no, we don't have to destroy our economy doing it. We can actually do it in a manner that in most cases may even bring costs in specific industries down. Yes, because there's no doubt we're in a transition. And I think from some people, they look and go, it's like all of a sudden we're shutting everything down. Uh, and that's that scares people. You think, listen, yeah. we're, we're, like this isn't going to happen overnight. It can't happen overnight. Um, no. You know, you can't even get the resources, the materials, you can't instigate the policy. Although the policies have started, we've seen a lot of movement from the, the Biden infrastructure bill. We're seeing some of the critical metal strategies. These take years though to implement. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And that's a good thing. We've got the, the impetus, but at the same time, when it's mixed in with the, uh, uh, the, the alarmism of it's all over, it's the end, that is a bit too stressful. Uh, I think if we can remind people they, they're just, it's noble what we're trying to achieve. Uh, there's certain key areas that are more maybe important that we should be focused on and that there's no point, there's no harm in taking little chunks out of the problem at a time rather than well, say, wait to yesterday was with the news of nuclear fusion breakthrough of going, wait, all right, everyone sit back. We've got it all figured out, which is not the case, right. but, but we've got the technology the now. Everything's okay. And, and, and I agree with you there again, Andrew, um, you know, the, the idea that people are going to wait until there's a perfect solution. We see this over and over and over again um, in all kinds of human problems where we end up with situations where people are making that perfection the enemy of improvement. Yes. And we've got to stop that idea. The, the, the COP reports have told us that the best thing we can do is take whatever we can and whatever improvements we can make and apply them as quickly as possible. You know, even if it's not achieving a goal of a 40% reduction by this date or a 50% reduction by this date, that we should get on it now. And yet we keep running into this issue where we've got a significant portion of the voting population in North America, less so in Europe, but obviously there's some skeptics over there as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I won't call them skeptics. I'm not going to give them the benefit of saying, well, your position is a valid position. I like to call them either climate fools or I like to call them climate hardheads. Yeah. I mean, I look at it this way. You've got people arguing they're, you know, that carbon dioxide is not a greenhouse gas. Okay. What you're arguing against at that point is not only science but you're arguing against your ability to do an experiment that a grade five student can do, can do. in their yes. sleep. I mean, the first part of the question is, is there any scientific basis for believing that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas? The answer is yes, emphatically so. We know what happens on the earth, sunlight comes down. I'm sitting here in Argentina in Buenos Aires. It is abnormally hot for this time of year. It's like 37 degrees outside. 
And what happens is sunlight comes down, hits the ground, and becomes heat. Well, what's heat? Heat is just infrared light. Okay, so you've got infrared light that radiates off the ground. Boy, do we all know about that infrared light when we're walking around near pavement in the middle of the summer on a hot day and you can feel the bottoms of your legs cooking. And that's what that is. It re-radiates as heat, as light towards space. The problem is some gases like carbon dioxide, like methane, are really, really good at catching those infrared photons and then they re-radiate as heat, but now in all directions. So what was mostly heat progressing out of the atmosphere towards space now becomes heat that scatters in all directions. In fact, a significant portion of it right back toward the earth. Yeah. So it's that blanket effect. It's, it's like a mantle that basically keeps everything warm below. And that's a problem. Now, if you don't believe that's true, easy experiment. Take a jar, take a little bit of vinegar, take a little bit of baking soda, throw it in, cover it up, let the excess pressure out, but cover it up. And what you've done is you've filled the jar with carbon dioxide. By the way, you haven't heated anything up with that reaction. You've actually cooled that jar down. So you're starting with a colder jar than a jar of air next to it. Stick a cover over that jar of air, put them both in the sun. Tell me which one's hotter in about a half an hour. Yeah. It's not going to be hard to tell, believe me. I don't even know if that's a grade five science experiment, but these people who claim that carbon dioxide isn't a greenhouse gas, they haven't even done that. And then the other side of the equation, well, we can't be the driver. It's not human, it's not anthropogenic, human driven climate change at all. Give me a break. All you have to do, again, a little bit of research, please do it if you're a skeptic. And then, and then tell me why we're wrong. Look up how much oil was extracted from the earth in the last year. Look up how much natural gas was extracted from the earth in the last year. Look up how much coal was extracted from the earth in the last year. Now, let's assume that those all get burned. And we're going to be a little off on that assumption, but let's assume, because I look around me here, I don't see large piles of coal building up. So something's happening with that coal. Yeah. I mean, it's going someplace. And most of it isn't extracted to sit in a stockpile, it's extracted to burn. If you then total up the amount of carbon dioxide that's generated in consuming each one of those feeds, and you look at the overall size of the atmosphere, what you're gonna find is that amount of stuff being burned, that amount of carbon containing material being consumed should raise the rate, the, the level of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere by about four parts per million per year. Well, guess what? Over the last decade or so, it's been going up by two to three parts per million. Now, some gets dissolved in the oceans, granted, there's your difference. And yes, we're having a negative effect on it too, on, on carbon dioxide levels by chopping down forests and by changing and by changing the nature, the, the structure of the ecosystems around us. But we're doing more than enough to raise the level of carbon dioxide in the air by a considerable amount. And we know it's a greenhouse gas. There's our climate change problem. And then the question revolves back to, okay, but what can we do about it?